talking today on a chapter from Luke, Luke 24, um, verses 36 to 40, um, 49. And so I'm going to just going to read this now. So it's when Jesus appears to his disciples. So it says, while they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they had seen a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled, and why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones, as, I, as you see I have. Then he said, when he said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it, because of joy and amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything to eat? So they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. He said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. Like, wow. (laughs) He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name and all nations, beginning in Jerusalem. You are my witnesses of these things. I'm going to send you what my father has promised. But stay in the city until you have been clothed with the power from on high. David, would you like to come? (laughs) Good morning. Uh, So good to be with you. Uh, It's a privilege as always, and indeed an excitement for us to be sharing together God's word this morning. Lord Jesus Christ, take my lips and speak through them. Take our minds and think through them. And take our hearts and set them on fire with love for you, for your holy name's sake. Amen. George Eliot, the Victorian novelist, was not a Christian, but she described this story, The Road to Emmaus, as the loveliest story in all the world. She lived for a while in Worksworth, um, visiting her, her uh, relatives there, staying in a cottage which is still there on the, on the right-hand side of the road as you go into Worksworth. And uh, her time there was inspiration for the novel Adam Bede. A bit of literary information for which there is no extra charge. Uh, but the important thing was that uh, she said it is the loveliest story in all the world. And it's the one we're looking at, or half of it. It's in two halves. The first half up to verse uh, 30. 334 uh, is about an outward journey of two uh, disciples, two companions, uh, maybe two men, maybe a, a man and his wife, we don't know, from Jerusalem to the village of Emmaus, about seven miles west of Jerusalem. And they are disconsolate and downcast because they believe that Christ has died. The Messiah from whom they had hoped so much was dead. And in verse 21, their mood is encapsulated. We had hoped, we had hoped, but it is not to be. And then the second half of the story is the journey back, still seven miles, uh, from Emmaus to Jerusalem, back into the center of things, back into the place where Christ had died and risen, back to the place that the disciples traveling away from Jerusalem had turned their back against. And now the mood is completely different. It is one of joy and exhilaration. Uh, as they journey that that distance uh, into Jerusalem with the good news that they have met the risen Christ. Now, between those two halves of the story, there are the pivotal verses, uh, which I'll come back to at the end, but I'll just read now, um, which sparks off the whole change of mood. Verse, uh, Verse 30 of Luke 24. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. 
They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? So between the desolate journey out and the joyful journey back, there is this amazing encounter where these two disciples, so downcast, so confused, so lost, meet the risen Christ. Now, we're going to talk about the second half where they journey back in Jerusalem. It's a passage full of color and life and activity. We could be here for a long time, but we won't, uh, I promise you, very briefly. But I want to look at it through the lens of one single question. And the question is this. When someone comes to encounter the risen Christ, what difference does that make to their lives? Okay? There are four things that I want to highlight. The first one will come up on the screen because the people doing the stuff have promised to listen to the sermon. <laughs> Thank you, Zoe. When we encounter the risen Christ, when anyone encounters the risen Christ, their lives are energized where before they were weary. Now, just consider the situation. A few verses earlier and a few minutes earlier, they had arrived at the house and Jesus, they didn't know it was Jesus, made to move on. And they said, no, 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 you can't do that. It's dark, it's cold, it's wet, possibly. It's certainly dangerous. You're tired. You can possibly go another seven miles. Come and stay with us. And now, ten minutes later, they're off. Travelling through the darkness and the danger and the weariness, all forgotten, another seven miles. From here, say, to the far side of um, Duffield. I think Duffield's about five miles from here. So a little bit further, three hours journey. Middle of the night, leave their supper on the table, and off they go because they are energised by the encounter they had with Christ. And they arrive in Jerusalem, and it could be so annoying. You know what it is when you've got some news, and you go to a person, and they say, hang on, I know. I know already. I could have told you. So, so infuriating. I don't know whether they felt like that. But when they got to the disciples in Jerusalem, the disciples said, Peter's seen Christ. We believe he's risen. They said, well, we've just seen him. We know he's risen. That's why we've come. Such excitement. The energy of an encounter with Jesus Christ which dispels the weariness. That is the first thing I want us to take hold of this morning. That you may be re-energized by an encounter with Christ that will make you want to, or perhaps not run seven miles, most of us could, well, no, that's rude, most of you could, I couldn't, but energized in your spirit to want to tell of the experience that you have had. Then there's a second thing. Here it comes, peace, not confusion. If we go back to the text, it's very interesting. They've tra <laughs> traveled the seven miles, they're, they're shattered, they're, but they're excited and they're listening and talking to their other disciples. And while they were still talking, verse 36, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. Please don't yawn, uh, Phil. Uh, <laughs> it's too early in the sermon for that. <laughs> peace be with you. I'm sorry, Phil, I didn't mean that. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, why are you troubled and why do you doubts arise in your mind? Look at my hands and my feet. It's I myself touch and see. Does a ghost have flesh and blood? And then he takes the bit of broiled fish and he says, look at my hands and my feet. Remember John 19, uh, Thomas, Thomas, put your, your fingers into my hands. I'm real, I'm here, I'm risen. Do you have anything to eat? And, and then he said, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms. He opened their mind to the scriptures and so on. So here they are. They're excited, they've come back, they're shattered. And uh, suddenly Jesus appears in his resurrected, risen body. S the same but different. The prototype of what our bodies will be like after our death in Christ. Free from limitation and pain. 
but utterly recognizable. It's interesting. So uh, they say, I've lost my thread now, you see, I've gone, off, gone down a rabbit hole. Um, but Christ comes and he says, peace be with you. And the peace breaks in to the turmoil of their emotions. Look at the words in the text. They're frightened, they're bewildered, they're excited, they're doubting, they're joyful, they're amazed, all at once, complete all over the place. And Jesus into that says, I want you to know my peace. Now, the peace of Christ is not a glassy calm. It is a mighty confidence. The peace of Christ does not become us. It builds into our energy with wonderful conviction that Christ is alive. He wanted them to know that he was alive. He said, look at my hands. Look at the wounds. That's not a ghost. Give me some fish to eat. No problem. I'm alive. I'm risen. I'm here. I'm with you. I'm for you. And I want you to have a mighty confidence in that fact which will bring together all your mixed emotions. All the emotions don't go away. Every day we have mixed emotions of, of joy and sorrow. I wake up very anxious most mornings of the week and I feel ashamed about it. But, but when I get up, I, I begin slowly to feel better. And, and by now I'm sort of coming awake, which just as well for you really. Um, and so Christ says to them, my peace is with you. And when you have encountered the risen Christ, he will pour into your life the peace which is demonstrated as a mighty confidence that he is really risen and alive. And then the third thing, they move from understanding, from doubt to understanding. Uh, he says to them, uh, this is what I told you when I was with you. Everything must be fulfilled that was written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. That is all three sections of their Old Testament. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the Scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead, and repentance and forgiveness of his sins will be preached in his name, you are witnesses of these things. Now, this is the third time on this journey that Jesus has opened the Scriptures. And can you imagine, we had a Bible study with Jesus leading it, three times in one day. And he must have been possibly a bit exasperated. He said, look, if you knew your Scriptures, you wouldn't be in the state that you have been. And you wouldn't be confused and excited in a peculiar way that you're at the moment. If you'd read the scriptures, you would know two things. You would know that the redemption of the Messiah was coming, and it was coming through the death and resurrection of Jesus. The redemption was coming not through victory and release of the Jews' hope, but through suffering and death and rebirth. And moreover, you would have known that the response to that always and everywhere is repentance and forgiveness of sins. Now he says, you should have read the scriptures. And then you would have known. And he opened their minds to the word of God, to their Old Testament. We have so much more. We have the Gospels and the Epistles and the book of Revelation, as you know. So an encounter with Christ will begin, begin to take away our weariness. It will begin to dispel our confusion and it will begin to lift our doubts. I want to encourage you to study the scriptures. When I was preaching here last week, which is only a few weeks ago, I don't know, I've got on twice so quickly, but I have. Um, I was telling you the excitement I had with my uh, birthday gift, The Bible for Everyone. I am so excited by this book, and I'm working, I'm working through it. Uh, and I'm in the middle of the book of Numbers, which is, all about, uh, well, about numbers, really. <laughs> it's, a, it's a nightmare, particularly if you're not a mathematician. But, but it's just so good to read it and to keep going. And, and suddenly to find a gem at the end of chapter 6 is the ironic blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance and give you his peace. In the middle of the book of Numbers. 
And I can't wait to get to Deuteronomy and John. I'll be at it for, well, I may not finish it, uh, <laughs> but, but I'll try. So I want to encourage you that the, the, the outworking of an encounter with Jesus Christ is that he will energize you again if you're weary. And then he will lift your confusion with his peace. And he will open your mind to the truth of his word, which will sustain you day by day by day. And then there's a fourth thing. He opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. Uh, faith and repentance, repentance and forgiveness of sin will preach in his name, beginning at Jerusalem. Verse 48, you are witness of these things. I'm going to send you what my Father has promised. But wait in the city until you are clothed with power from Wait until the Holy Spirit. I'm going to send, you thought you'd seen a, the, you thought you'd seen a get ghost. I'm going to send you the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, to come you, to give you life, to enable you to bear witness in the way that you are supposed to be doing. But wait for that to happen. Wait in the city. And they did. And on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 1, verse 8, the power of the Holy Spirit came upon them. Our family have just been away on a little jolly uh, to the Hebrides, to the Isle of Harris. And uh, there were 11 of us, and it was great fun. Seven of us in a, mi in a, in a minibus for 11 hours. Wish we did all right, didn't you? You drove brilliantly, Phil. And the, no arguments, no, no arguments with the mother-in-law. It was great, and uh, oh gosh, I was coming up. Um, and we had a wonderful time there. Last Sunday, the wind speed was seventy miles an hour. We could barely stand, but it's just an amazing place. I won't bore you with it. I've just got some photographs if you want to see afterwards. <laughs> uh, but in the evening, Sunday evening, four of us, uh, Phil and Anna and Sue and I, uh, went in the minibus up to the Isle of Lewis, which is joined to Harris, about an hour and a quarter, up onto the west coast, a little place called Barvis. And Barvis was the village where 40, uh, 49 years, no, 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 74 years ago, 1949, under the control, not under the control, under the leadership of a man called Duncan Campbell, the Holy Spirit descended in power upon the whole community. You can read the story, it's just incredible. And we stood in the same chapel where God had come down 74 years and, and we, we felt a bit like spiritual uh, voyeurs really and we shouldn't have been looking at the sights but we saw the village, we, we saw uh, the site of the little cottage where two old ladies, Christina and Peggy Smith, 96 and 93, one blind, one after two, prayed through the night, three nights a week, for six months, for God to come, and God came. And Anna and I particularly, because we're the most holy members of the family, <laughs> have been very interested in the Hebridean revival, and, and just to go to that place was sorry. And the, and, and the spirit, I mean, it's complex about revival, I, I understand that. But the Spirit came down because the whole community were waiting and praying for that power. So I want to say to you this morning, um, if you have met the the, the, uh, had an encounter with the risen Christ, then you will live with expectation and you will be lifted out of your complacency. Oh, nothing happens around here, we can't expect much. Um, but you know, we trod along and God is good and we're okay. We're lifted out of that mindset into a mindset of breathless expectancy. God, will you come in power? Now, I want to end where I began with the encounter. Let's just read it again. Um, verse 30. When he was at table with them, he took bread he gave thanks, he broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. Everything in their bodies was changed. 
their, mind, their, their, their eyes were opened, their hearts were burning, their spirits were lifted, their feet were energized, their mind was released of its blindness, their tongues were loosed to speak, the whole body infiltrated by the risen Christ. So I simply want to say to you this morning, and I actually want to say it to myself as well, we are in the midst of, I believe, and, and I'm, not, I'm not a pessimist, I'm an optimistic chap on the whole, but I believe, we, I believe we're in the midst of multiple crises in our generation, uh, culturally, mental health, state of our children, across the world, Iraq, Russia, Middle East, Iran now muscling in and facing up to Israel, what will that lead to? And your own personal story of whatever it may be that you're under pressure. I want to say to you, maybe you need a fresh encounter with the risen Christ to lift your weariness, to take away your confusion, to dispel your doubt, and to open your mouth expectantly to cry for the presence of the Holy Spirit. And it may be there's some people here this morning and you've never encountered Christ. I want to say to you, you can. And you can do it now, this morning, before you leave church. And your life can be turned upside down by that encounter.